Hello to everybody in the room. Gosh, it's great to see you. And now I'm going to take advantage of the video streaming by that camera back there to talk directly to Joe Bass and Diane. Joe, get better. We're thinking about you. Diane, you're a great lady, a wonderful person, brilliant mind. But by, you've had, I want you to know that uh, Jim Lakely and uh, James Taylor and uh, Jay Lair and everybody working for you, Bertie and uh, Bert, uh, Bernie and uh, Barney, What's her name down there at the desk? Uh, Nikki. Nikki. Oh, of course, Nikki. <laughs> Nikki. Oh, my God, Nikki. They've all done a fabulous job. This is the best conference you have had. And the speakers have been fabulous. <laughs> Gosh. And Joe, we love you. But by the end of this talk, you may hate me. <laughs> because I'm going to put a challenge to you and all the people at Heartland. And to my friend, Anthony Watts, who was honored this morning, Anthony, to you, buddy. You were terrific. The challenge is gonna be under you too, because as one of my great heroes, Dr. Happer, who I'm happy to see in the room, said last night, the world is living like Alice in Wonderland, and we got to get back to Earth. And Dr. Happer, I'm going to try to help us do it. That's my goal here today, and I desperately mean that. Now, does everybody in the room agree that there is no significant man-made global warming? All right, and nobody argues with that. Well, the question is then, how did this bad science sweep around the world and take control? My science, my lifetime, Dr. Happer's science, Anthony Watt's science, many of you in the rest of this room and up at this table, our science, it has been taken over by this bad notion about carbon dioxide being this super incredible positive forcing element and creating this great crisis of global warming climate change. Well, what can we do to correct that situation? Now, let's talk about me for a minute. 61 years on television. Uh, that was my life, my world. Studios coast to coast. Uh, I was in Chicago. I was in New York. I worked for stations owned by CBS and NBC and ABC. And I was on ABC's Good Morning America. And I uh, had 41 years before I went out to San Diego for my retirement job at KUSI TV. And everybody I worked with was, anybody shout it out? A Democrat. <laughs> they hated Republicans. They hated the third parties. I'm not kidding. If there was a, a slight doubt in anybody's mind, if there was a Republican in the whole batch of them, in all those newsrooms where I worked, in all of those television stations and networks, if there was one buddy who, anybody who wasn't a Democrat, they were deep in the closet. <laughs> and during those years, now think about it, 40 years of it, starting in 1953 and running until 1994 and continuing today, though I'm just not among them anymore, those TV stations were a great force, perhaps the most powerful force in the nation. After all, they had a major voice in who was elected to office in all levels of government, local government, county government, state government, federal government. Politicians tried to support the very issues that those stations presented. So it is no surprise that Big Al was one of the people they supported. The liberal media down there in Tennessee pushed behind Mr. Gore and he became a U.S. Senator. And oh, did they love his book, Earth and the Balance, because it was an environmentalist book, a liberal book. 
And it was about a threat to our civilization because of global warming resulting from the burning of fossil fuels. And it said that the sky is falling. Yes, they got him to Washington, right here where we are now. And just a few blocks down from us in the Senate hearing room, he turned off the air conditioner. He opened the windows on a day as hot as today or hotter. He got everybody a little sweaty and he told them all about global warming. And he brought in, oh, oh my God, the worst of them. Yep. I don't even want to say his name. You can read it. And the media loved it and they shouted, the sky is falling. And the federal dollars began to flow. And you've got to understand the extreme power of money. It is more powerful than the voice. It is more powerful than the idea. It is more powerful than the vote. And it is powerful. Money runs our country. Money runs the world. And in the purple on this chart, the money that began to flow with Al Gore on the left, and it has increased. And in uh, the last few years, 2009, it was up to $2.5 billion a year. And now it's up to a full three to $4 billion a year of our federal tax dollars going to research on global warming. And they will only go to one side. They won't go to a skeptic. And I have sat among the skeptics who were, who've been shut out uh, in the universities to, at this conference. A few of them are here. I think of my friend, Dr. Ingstrom, uh, as, as an example. Uh, and, and of course, really soon, so many of them cut out by that funding. But that money flows and the power of that money that money has funded over 10,000 research papers on global warming. 10,000 papers on one scientific idea. And they've looked at every conceivable angle from its effect on gnats and mosquitoes to its effect, of course, on the coastlines flooding and the people dying in heat waves. Yes, and every one of those research papers uh, has resulted in numerous news releases that go out to that liberal media and the media loves them. And that's why you read about it and you hear about it and you see it every day that the sky is falling, the national crisis is continuing, global warming, climate change, climate disruption is going to destroy our very lives and our civilization. You and I, we are in peril. It drives me nuts. I want to scream. My wife tells me don't scream. But it's hard to control. It is so hard. Because I know there is no significant man-made global warming. I know we're in a gla interglacial period and there's a natural warming that is oscillating along and has been for 12,000 years. I know, however, that there is no significant man-made global warming now. There hasn't been any in the past, and there's any, no reason to fear any in the future. Well, I have good news. The good news is that that average American family isn't spending their time so much anymore watching TV or reading those newspapers. Oh, no. Oh, no. Hello. Have you read the statistic? People under 20 get 80% of their video and written material off of their telephones. It is a revolution of historic proportions. Why do you think I retired from television? <laughs> Hell, it didn't mean much anymore. It's all on the phone. It's a revolution. And so they're watching YouTube. Well, we're on YouTube. We get on there. We do our best, get all the views we can. Uh, Al Gore's on YouTube. And I showed him, I got on after his talk and put in my comment about Al Gore's talk on YouTube. I did my part. 
How about Facebook? Oh, they're on Facebook. The phone, it's the main reason that way they go to Facebook. They don't go to Facebook on their pads anymore or on their PCs at home. It's on their phone they go to Facebook. I can go to Facebook on my PC, can you? On my phone, can you? They do. Well, I go there, the climate change debate roars on Facebook. Have you ever gone there and participated? It's there. And uh, how about Twitter? Well, I have a Twitter account. I have a couple of thousand followers. Jim Lakely has Twitters for Heartland. Twitters his heart out, God bless you, man. And it's deeply appreciated what you do. Well, here we are. Hello, Mr. Lakely. Hello, Joe Bass, watching on video. I have you, uh, I congratulate you for taking on the liberal media. I want you to understand that, Jim. I think you do a wonderful, wonderful job. And uh, I want Joe Bass to know that your company does a wonderful job. And here's an example. I wrote a memo to the uh, Hammer Museum uh, when they had Michael Mann coming there. And Joe said to Jim, put that out as a news release, and Jim did. And you say you sent 20,000? 20,000 media outlets received that news release. Dozens of website articles resulted. And I ended up on Coast to Coast AM with 12 million listeners. And I ended up on the Rush Limbaugh show with his listeners. And I ended up on uh, a link to the Drudge Report. And I ended up getting a mention on What's Up with that. And I ended up on two big TV interviews, uh, one with the, uh, Megyn Kelly on the Fox News Channel, and one on CNN's Media Matters, Reliable Sources, where, where they wanted to butcher me, and I had to really go after them. But look, how much impact did all that have on our efforts to beat this bad science, to get out of Alice in Wonderland and back to reality? I feared, we worked hard, we all did, but I feared it had little impact. Well, here's what I think we need to correct the bad science. We need a big new team of millennials. Are there any millennials in the room today? Are there any millennials attending this conference? Darn, darn few. And that's our problem. It's their world, not ours. They're the ones with the phones. We need not a team, we need a multitude of teams, and each of those teams needs to take on a particular source, a team for Facebook, a team for Twitter, a team for Wikipedia. Oh, Lord, do we need a team for Wikipedia? And sure, YouTube, two million views some of those items get in 24 hours on YouTube. We need a team of millennials for YouTube, and we need them on Yahoo News and every other site. We need them. We need them, we need them, because those millennials will reach the people who are getting their word by phone, and they will be voting for the politicians, and they will cut off the money. If we could get, if we could just get them down the street here to cut off that $5 billion a year, Wonderland would vanish. Without that money, it wouldn't be there anymore. Without that money, the whole bad science would collapse because no longer would Scripps Oceanographic Institute, no longer would UCLA Irvine, no longer would uh, Harvard and Princeton put research papers out about global warming. It would come to an end without the money, without the money. And how do we cut off the money? We get people in Congress and somebody in the White House who will stop the funding. It's as simple as that. And the only way to get to them, I'm afraid, is through teams of millennials. So my challenge is that Heartland Institute and Anthony Watts and Mark Morano and Joe Bastardi and all of the younger ones among us, recruit those millennials, build those teams. They spend $300,000, $400,000 putting on these conferences. 
take that money and say to these millennials, do great work and we'll help you with your student loans. We'll help you with your tuitions. We'll help you build your futures if you'll save the future of our bad science. Save our science for us. It's a deal I think we can make, but we need bright, strong people driving it. A new generation. And if there are no more of these conferences, then the next meeting put on by Heartland is a conference for millennials. I'll be at home, but I'll be cheering. Thank you very much. <laughs>